take your Bible with me, if you will. And I'd like to turn once again to the life of this character, Jacob. Chapter 32 in Genesis, specifically, is where we want to go to. Genesis chapter 32. The story of Jacob, to me, is both fascinating and striking because of his example of resisting God's will. He is so, we are so much like him. There is an absolute obstinance of our self will against God's will. That's precisely what happens when believers, regardless of all of the countless tender mercies that God's showered upon us, and God's patient, long-suffering, and yet we continue, it seems, to pursue what we want and to think what's best for us, and in doing so, push back against the will of God. You know, I think that Christians get the idea that when you give yourself up and surrender to the Lord, you have to come forward at the end of a church service, uh, at the invitation. But that's not the way it happened in Jacob's story. And I think there is a clue to a more promising way to deal with ourself, the self-life, I call it. What we have in Genesis chapter 32 and I'm just going to uh, quickly look at some things in verses 22 to verses 26. And it begins with battling, with battling. Let's pray, and I'll share with you what I have in mind. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for bringing us together here tonight. And Lord, I pray that our hearts are really prepared and open to what it is that you want to show us from the life of Jacob. I know, Lord, that uh, there is a lot of Jacob in me. There's a lot of Jacob in us. And we, we need your touch as he had your touch upon his life. Father, we ask that you'd give us spiritual insight, but most importantly, submissive hearts that we would say yes to the Spirit of God and what it is he has to show us from the Scripture this evening. Lord, we'll thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you for being so patient with us, take, taking such pain to deal with us as with children. We praise you for that and ask your blessing now as we submit to you in Jesus' name. I think there is battling in verses 22 to 24 in particular. Jacob is actually approaching the battle of his life. He found himself at this point alone with God. It says in verse 22 that he rose up that night, took his two wives, his two women servants, his 11 sons, and he passed over the ford Jabbok, and he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over that he had, and Jacob was left alone. I want to stop there for a moment. What perhaps you may not know is that what has set up this scene is that Jacob is on his way back home. He's been gone for 20 years, and he's going home, and he fled from home because his brother got so angry with him because of his deception and cheating his brother Esau that he wanted to kill him. Well, he just got information that his brother Esau is coming to meet him with 400 men. And as they advance, he is scheming to protect himself and his family. 
He takes his family, puts them on the other side of the, the river, and Jacob is without his family. He's done all he can to protect them and himself. And as we read in the first phrase of verse 24, Jacob is now alone. God gets him alone. And that's really the scene where God begins to work in this man's self-life. When God deals with us about our self-will, that stubbornness, that obstinance, that refusal to submit to God, our resistance against God, he gets us alone. And that's the place where God begins to work on Jacob, and that's how he begins to work on you and I. Jacob had been scheming to save his own skin, and God knew all about his scheming. And uh, God wanted Jacob to know him and to trust him. God wanted Jacob to come to a place where he wanted God more than anything else. I think it's interesting, at least noteworthy, to uh, understand that that uh, river bank that he is uh, going to encounter God that evening at, it's the river Jabbok, and it literally means a pouring forth or an emptying. And that is exactly what God is seeking to do in Jacob's life. He's seeking to empty him of self, and that's what God is seeking to do in all of our lives. If we haven't realized that, uh, perhaps tonight, we should understand the circumstances that we often find ourselves in. God uses them, or in, at least intends to use them, to be an emptying, to be a Jabbok. I want you to see verse 24 again. Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Now, it's as we continue to read on, that we come to realize that the man that Jacob was wrestling with was not his brother Esau, whom perhaps initially he thought that's who it was, but actually he was wrestling with God. That God came in a human form, and God wrestled with Jacob. And I want you to understand this. Someone asked me recently, is it right to wrestle with God? Well, I said, Go back to Genesis 32 and find out who initiated the wrestling match. It wasn't Jacob. God was the initiator. And the reason God initiated that wrestling match with Jacob is because God wanted to change Jacob's heart. And God confronts us because he wants to change our heart like he did Jacob. So, he begins to wrestle with Jacob. God is always the initiator in our deliverance, in our liberation from our self-will. When God wrestles with us, it's because he wants to deliver us from that, uh, that self that has its grip on us and keeps us back from enjoying the real blessing of God in our lives. So God's the initiator, and as a result, he's also the liberator. <laughs> Self-will. Like Jacob wrestling against the angel of the Lord, as he's called here in this passage. Self-will will fiercely resist God. And so God must wrestle with human beings. Not a physical way like he did here with Jacob, but God wrestles with me. God has wrestled with me, and, and I'm sure God has wrestled with you as well. God must wrestle with us. God will go to battle against our human will. God will fight. He will battle our self-will. Let me tell you what both James and Peter says. James 4.6, 1 Peter 5.5. 5. They both say the same thing. It says, 
God resisteth the proud. God resisteth the proud. You know what that word resisteth means? It means to arrange in battle array. It means that uh, God arranges himself in battle against the proud. And the proud is our self-will. So God is battling our self-will just as he wrestled with Jacob that night. And this is the toughest of all battles, but it determines whether you will be set free or you will remain in your bondage to yourself. There is a battling going on here. And look at what happens as a result of that battling in verse 25. When he, that is the angel of the Lord, when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. The battling becomes a breaking. Because of human resistance to God, and we will resist God till the bitter end. Because of resistance until the end, God, we, we have to ask God to break our resistance and to take control of our hearts and our minds. There's a breaking that comes as a result of the battling. God is and I hope you understand this, God is a crippler. He cripples Jacob here. God broke Jacob so he'd cripple his leg that he might be able to then really bless Jacob. And he couldn't bless him until he had broken him. God can't bless you and I until he breaks us. God breaks us to bless us. Because self-will, we demand to stand up on our own two feet and to be self-sufficient. But you know what? God can't bless us and use us when we're in that position. When we demand uh, to have it our way. And so God becomes the crippler. But God becomes the crippler so that he can become our enabler. He must break you so that instead of you relying upon your power, you learn to rely upon the power of God, the Holy Spirit's power. And so I have to ask you tonight to ask yourself, in, in the depths of your soul, are you willing to be broken for God? Now, what's it going to take, perhaps, to be broken for God? You need to have your own wrestling match with the Lord. The place Jacob called it Peniel, the face of God or the presence of God. You need your own Peniel. You need a moment in time when you meet Jesus face to face. You have to see yourself for who you truly are. You have to allow God to break you so that he can make you a person that prevails. You have to cry out to God for him to cleanse your heart and let him come and break you that he can give you his blessing. So there's battling, there's breaking, but look at verse 26, there's blessing. And he said, let me go. This is the angel of the Lord speaking. He said, let me go for the daybreak of dawn has come. And Jacob's reply, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Now, don't misunderstand what's going on here in verse 26, because I'll bet you have. And I want to clarify what's going on here. Most believers think that Jacob is trying to force 
blessing from God. And as a result, believers think that they have to convince God to bless them. That's not what's happening here. Not at all. There is a fight going on. The reality is that both Jacob and you and I are fighting against God. We are fighting to keep him from blessing us as long as we hold on to our own way and determine that we're not going to give in and submit and surrender to the Lord. The fight is Jacob is actually fighting God's blessing. That's what he's doing. You see, God wants to completely cleanse your heart. He wants to totally possess you. God wants to set you free. But all the time he's trying to do this to liberate you, you're fighting him. And you fight him for your chains, for your shackles. When God's simply seeking to set you free, to liberate you, we fight. We fight the very blessing of God by digging our heels in and saying, mm, that's where this far I go and no further. You know, I can think of Christians that have been around for decades, but they plateaued early on and they've never grown since. Their lives are really little or no use to God. They don't serve God. They're simply spectator Christians. They really do nothing for the Lord to speak of. They've stopped because they said, I will not do that. I will not submit. They're fighting the blessing of God. And so here's what happens. The fight turns into force. God, he doesn't, he doesn't force people to do anything, but he forces the issue. God knows how to circumstantially force the issue so that we have to face it and can't avoid it. What God does at this point, when he touches Jacob's thigh and puts it out of joint, he forces the issue and he makes Jacob choose. Now, you can choose to submit or not submit, but God forces the issue here. He puts force on Jacob when he touches his thigh and puts it out of joint. He fought with Jacob all night long, and now the dawn had come. And Jacob looks up, and, and, and God said something like, All right, I've tried. You've resisted. I'm leaving. And Jacob, at that moment, faces the most desperate time that anyone can ever face when they come close to God, and yet they continue to fight against him. God, uh, God's answer was simply this. Look, Jacob, if you don't want my best, I'll leave you alone. And I think it's at that point that Jacob panicked. And I'm sure, I don't know what he said, but I, at least in his mind, he's thinking, you're not going to leave me like this, are you? I've lost my cattle. I've lost my sheep, my goats, my wives, my children, everything. And now do I lose you too? This was the blessed moment for Jacob because he really, at this point, finally saw the value of God himself. He lost everything else. Everything else in his mind was gone. Esau was going was gonna to wipe him out. That's the way he felt. But at this point, he saw the value of nothing else but God. You're fighting God. You may even not know that you're fighting God. I think we usually know it, but you might not realize that you're fighting God. 
you're keeping God from giving you the best that he has for you. And if you continue to fight him, eventually God will leave you alone. And as I said, you'll plateau and you'll never move on. You'll never see higher ground. That's a miserable life as a Christian. I'd hate to be hanging there for the rest of my life on this earth. I just wonder if we've ever learned the value of just having God himself. I wonder if you tonight are desperate to have God or to retain his presence in your life because that's so important because that's where the blessing lies. That's where the blessing is. There comes a time where we have to stop our games. We have to stop our foolishness. We have to stop fooling around and playing around with uh, the Christian life and really get serious and let God truly bless us as he desires to do. Psalm 51, 17 says, the sacrifices that God wants from people are not animal sacrifices. What he wants from people is a broken and contrite heart. A broken heart is a shattered heart. And it's not until our, the pride of our heart is shattered that we will begin to possess spiritual understanding. Until God shatters our self-life, will we be enabled to be useful to God and live a real meaningful and purposeful life? You know, as you get older, there comes a time in your life, maybe you haven't gotten there yet, I have, maybe you haven't gotten there yet, where you look back on your life and say, what have I done for the Lord? What do I have to show for all these years? Why did I waste all this time? You want meaning and purpose in your life? Then in this battling and in this breaking, give in so God can give you the blessing. And you'll die happy. <laughs> and you will meet the Lord, not with shame, but with joy. But it all comes down to this that you surrender yourself will completely to the Lord.